Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, and best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to learn how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Transform Now podcast. I'm Brad Hairston with Blue Prism. My guest today is Kevin Smiley, Managing Director with the global advisory firm Alvarez and Marsal. And Kevin is based in the Dallas area. Today's topic is intelligent automation as a core competency. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Brad. It's great to be here. So why don't you start off with a quick introduction, tell everyone about yourself and what you do at Alvarez and Marcel. Sure thing. Uh, let me start off with a little bit about the firm. You know, for nearly four decades now, can't believe it's going to be that, that long, A&M has been helping organizations tackle complex business issues and boost operating performance. Uh, we work as advisors, interim leaders, and partners who will tell you what you need to know, but not always what you want to hear. You know, we're known for asking tough questions, listening well, uh, digging in and rolling up our sleeves. We're a firm of fact-driven and action-oriented operators and consultants. Our focus is on moving our clients forward to where they need to be. As for me personally, I've been with a and going on eight years now. My focus is on enabling business performance through technology and services. And that's a place where intelligent automation clearly comes into play. So Kevin, let me let me give a little context to our discussion and then I've got a lot of a lot of questions to ask you. So intelligent automation, I think you would agree has been one of the hottest topics over the past decade, let's say. But there's there's a definite trend in the market that we at Blue Prism have noticed. Many companies have had early success implementing a program uh, around digital labor and then from there, they've moved on to automate at least two or three more waves of business process automation based on you know their early success. Most of them have also put a center of excellence in place to institute a robotic operating model and you know manage the digital workforce to that. Beyond that point, however, a lot of these companies have just not scaled their intelligent automation capability across functions and lines of business. Instead, they many of them have moved to what, what you might call kind of a maintenance mode. And instead of looking for new ways to automate and to grow the, the uh, program and, and the benefits received, they, they are content to stay put and, and deal with it in, a, in more of a reactive mode than a proactive mode. I like to say it's like having a Ferrari in the garage, but you're riding a skateboard to work each day. Sorry for the corny expression, but as a fellow Texan, I think you appreciate those. I do. I do. So let's start there, Kevin. I mean, first of all, do you and your colleagues at Alvarez and Marsal see things the same way in terms of intelligent automation, adoption, and expansion? Is, is that a trend that you guys have picked up on? Yes, it is. We're we're seeing a similar slowdown in expansion. I wouldn't call it a full halt, uh, but certainly a slowdown in it. And our observations are that we're we're seeing it play out in one of three scenarios. Um, there are first early adopters who see moderate to good success in terms of overall cost savings, and as a result, they they become complacent uh, with the automation they have in place and generally lose their motivation to continue innovating. They got the benefit they wanted, they can check the automation box, and now they're moving on to the next cost savings initiative. Right. The, the second group, different story. They see little to no success, uh, maybe due to poor governance and setup, and therefore they see no need to continue down this path. It didn't work for them, right? So they're typically organizations that are more risk adverse, and they're waiting to see what happens with others before trying again or doubling down on their first investment. And then finally, the third group may have one business unit that's realizing a solid ROI 
you know, they're utilizing and deploying automation in ways that are unique to their particular business unit. But they're essentially keeping it a secret from the rest of the business. With their reasoning being that, you know, they had to pay for this. So other groups shouldn't get to use it unless they invest in their own implementation or help the first BU recover their investment. So a theme we've seen take shape is that companies using RPA and, and intelligent automation to cover for fundamentally broken processes versus fixing them in house with their current capabilities and then using that automation to take them to the next level. And you've been around the consulting game for a while, you know the challenges that presents because starting off with the wrong framing for how you're going to apply automation really makes a difference. Uh, and just using it to paper over a broken process is not how to get the most value from it. So we wanna see, if we wanna see this type of automation start to scale, it starts with understanding the right problems to tackle and having a rational set of expected outcomes to achieve from that work. And I have to say, I, I totally agree with your comment about redesigning, fixing the process before you automate it. Absolutely agree with that. Kevin, in your opinion, what are some of the root causes of organizations failing to scale their intelligent automation solution across the enterprise? Well, in addition to unrealistic expectations, which is, you know, always out there, the stall tends to come in one of three areas. Uh, apparently three is the magic number today, so bear with me if we'd use three a lot. Okay. Uh, first, the purpose for the initial adoption was, was really not sufficient to drive to success. You know, they were getting pressure from board members or activist investors, or they saw competitors jumping into intelligent automation versus the company's leadership actually having an authentic understanding of how that automation can benefit their company. Uh, in some ways, it's, it can also be attributed to myopic thinking. You know, they have a singular focus on decreasing costs, typically by means of replacing FTEs with bots, you know, which as we know is, is really very early thinking around this topic and, and doesn't get into the real business benefits that adopting automation could derive for their business uh, once they scale, like delivering better customer experiences or increasing employee satisfaction or just driving additional revenue in addition to cost savings. So not thinking broadly enough about the outcomes that can be achieved with intelligent automation and, and perhaps being way too laser focused on cost reduction. Yeah, that, ma that makes a lot of sense. So what's, what's another issue you've seen, Kevin? We, we've also seen what, uh, something that I think when I was younger, my parents would call having your, your eyes bigger than your stomach. You know, the, the <laughs> willingness to adopt automation isn't necessarily matched by the ability to adopt and scale. So what do I mean by willingness? So when I say that, I mean someone in the company, possibly a leader or someone under them, got excited, they riled up enough people to set out a mandate to do some experimentation in part of a business unit or their part of the business unit. The willingness to explore implementing automation is there. When we think about a company having the ability to implement those initiatives, it boils down to leadership, governance, and strategy, essentially having the resources and plan in place to execute effectively. Mm -hmm. So the problems with ability typically stem from a bottoms up approach versus a top down approach. And that starts with not having a champion at the top. You know, there's no C-suite or small mass of C-suite champions asking for the technology. And our A&M research and experience suggests that leadership has to be equipped with that, again, authentic understanding and personal knowledge of what the benefits of intelligent automation and the strategy that goes with it need for it to take hold and scale. And when there's no champion at the top, the experimentation is happening in pockets within individual business units and success stories are sometimes kept hidden either intentionally or unintentionally. Totally agree with the importance of, of a strong C-level champion and, and too often that is missing. What, what about the operating model and, and the center of excellence put in place to manage that? How do you see that impacting 
a company's ability to scale? Well, you know, the, the good thing is we see a lot of early adopters putting centers of excellence in place, which is a, a good technique in general. However, the end results are what matter. And many times among these early adopters, these COEs are ineffective. So, you know, purely having a centralized COE, for example, which is often the case uh, in these situations leads to a translation problem. The centralized COE doesn't speak the same language as the people in the lines of business that are trying to utilize the automation. That leads to underutilization of these new capabilities. And the COE ends up deploying a push marketing strategy, trying to sell digital solutions to the business units, which by the way, COEs as a general rule, aren't made up of people who are good at selling and no offense <laughs> to anybody in a COE, but that's not why they got into a COE for automation to <laughs> go sell. What the COE really wants is to have experts in digital transformation in the business units coming to the COE with ideas of how to utilize those new capabilities. Now, the, the flip side to the centralized COE is a decentralized one, of course. And the, the BUs tend to work in silos uh, in those situations, and you don't get the value of that centralized perspective and governance and sharing of ideas. And that results in a whole myriad of other issues that slow down or halt the intelligent automation adoption. So from our perspective, a federated COE is the form that most often leads to increased success and scale. Mm -hmm. You know, where the governance is centralized, but the expertise and implementation responsibility is decentralized out in the business. Okay. From the, you know, back to the original question, the, the third thing that we're seeing impacting this is companies resisting being on the, quote, bleeding edge of, te of change, right? Which, you know, interesting concept of what constitutes that, but... Ron Orsini is one of my partners in A&M that leads our corporate transformation services. And he's observed that many of the business leaders we work with want something to be proven before they're willing to attempt a wholesale adoption on an enterprise scale. Makes perfect sense, right? It's just natural risk aversion. Mm -hmm. But they, they don't just want it proven once. They want to see a number of credible examples they can relate to before taking such a big risk with their companies. And unless there's a real impetus, some sort of burning platform, you know, they'll continue along the journey with the capabilities they have in place and things that they know have been proven to lower cost, improve quality, or improve their speed to market, three things that are important to all businesses. So intelligent automation you know, isn't the first major technology shift these leaders have encountered. Uh, in many cases, they've been burned before by you know, bleeding edge technology investments. Uh, that have resulted in a negative or unclear payback that they had to answer for. Most of those with that experience aren't inching to repeat it anytime soon. Yeah, it is a little hard to believe that there are still companies that view intelligent automation as bleeding edge. <laughs> but yeah. but I do know that is the case, especially in you know specific industries. Kevin, what what is the key to reversing this trend? And, and changing the way that intelligent automation is viewed and utilized? Well, you know, it, it, you and I have been around this for a while now. So we, we see it from our lens as being more mature and more adopted and more successful. And, and it has certainly progressed along that, that path. But this is still a relatively new management lever for most organizations. So again, differentiating between a technology and a tool, or not a tool, but a, a capability a management team can use to run their organization or make it more competitive. So at this stage, it's still viewed as a technology rather than as a lever. And the key to reversing this trend is helping leaders understand how intelligent automation can impact their business performance and make it a core competency of their business instead of just another technology that they have employed. So how does a company effectively make intelligent automation a core competency? That's a great question because uh, it's not an easy one to answer. But it, it, from our perspective, it begins with a concerted effort across three key areas. And I mentioned them before, leadership, governance, and strategy. And let's start with leadership first. Um, it is imperative to have at least one C-suite champion 
who has that understanding of automation capabilities and limitations uh, to understand where it can actually deliver benefits and where it can't. That same champion needs to be a trusted peer among their C-suite colleagues, uh, because without that peer leader support of the initiative that the champion is trying to implement, it's gonna be dead in the water. They just mm -hmm. have to work together as a team. Right. The leadership also requires funding, right? You, this, this is not something you can just go and do and not expect it to cost something. The initial investment should come from an executive innovation fund. That's usually a good way to start something like this. And then once you confirm that the investment is having a positive result, you can plan, uh, put the plans in place for scale. In addition, you want to plan for addressing things like cost allocation, cost transparency, and pricing. And consider those carefully as things progress because those can be sticking points when you try to roll this out on a broader basis. And then the last point on leadership is really around incentives. Um, you know, particularly at the executive level, people do what they're incented to do. Uh, so once a decision has been made to scale up intelligent automation capabilities, executive incentives and compensation should be updated appropriately to make sure that leadership buy-in and motivation is consistent even to the point of leadership scorecards should reflect the ROI or lack thereof, you know, depending on how things are progressing uh, from that intelligent automation strategy. And mm -hmm. let, me get, let me give you a real life example. So uh, TD Bank up in Canada, the number two bank in Canada made strategic decisions over the last five years to completely transform the way they think about and utilize leading edge technologies. And before implementing the majority of the automation they have in place now, they asked important questions and did the hard work to find out why they needed to integrate automation and how it could be most beneficial, starting with quick wins that would lead to transformational progress over their peers and over time. Their particular digital transformation led them to acquire a startup. They made the decision they didn't have the right capabilities internally to get them all the way there. So they bought a startup named Layer 6 that allowed them to better understand their customer and create tailored experiences based on the information they could learn about their clients. In addition to the implementation of bots and, and artificial intelligence, they were a very outspoken leader and supporter of the movement in Canada to retain the talented technology developers that they have in Canada, where in the past they had lost very high percentages of them to Silicon Valley. And they've been working mm. to flip that around because the combination of having the strategy, but also having the skills and the people to do the work was critical to their success. Well, I don't think you could have chosen a better example of a company that truly built up a world-class automation program through strong top-down leadership. Well, please continue. What What's another way to make intelligent automation a core competency? The, the next area would be governance. And so we've talked a little bit about centers of excellence before and that you know we're gonna come right back to it. Mm -hmm. um, setting that up and planning it for scale is exceptionally important. You know, a good practice is a version of the federated COE we discussed earlier, where you have governance at the center and change advocates and super users at the business unit level. You know, the business unit workers are the ones that are best equipped to identify the right use cases within their day-to-day -day work to have the automation begin to have meaningful impacts on the overall performance of the organization. So it's critical not only that they're equipped, but they also have change advocates within the business unit who are there with them day in, day out, who understand the automation and are versed enough to teach it to them uh, and help them continue to grow and develop that capability. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of the governance is uh, what I would call a service catalog or cost allocation. You know, the, the COE needs to be able to provide clear examples of the return on investment they've accomplished throughout the business down to what it costs and the revenue generated or cost savings gained as a result. It's just, you just have to do that to create the financial buy-in to keep the focus on results instead of the accounting, because otherwise you get tied up in you know, who's paying for which portion of which cost. And that really takes you away from the intent, which is impacting the outcomes of the business performance. So I like to think of a service catalog of sorts where the business unit 
that using the automation pays per consumption. And the various departments can choose from some predetermined pricing, small, medium, or large engagement packages, for example, or t-shirt sizes, another way to think about it. And then they get a report outlining their investment and benefits received as a result of deploying the automation. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned the benefits realization piece. That, that is so important. And, and it's the reason we at Blue Prism have added partners to our ecosystem, such as Shibumi, to, uh, to address that. I believe Al Reza Marsal also knows Shibumi. I, we, we have heard the name, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's your third way to, uh, to, to help make IA or intelligent automation a core competency? Well, the, the third aspect is strategy. And having an enterprise strategy and plan is crucial from the get-go. As, as we discussed earlier, one-off deployments will only get you so far and they won't get you where you really want to be. So let, let's talk about a real life example. Uh, and it's one it, most everyone should be aware of and it's Amazon. And if you're not, you don't buy anything apparently. Uh, so <laughs> Amazon is a great <laughs> example of an organization utilizing an enterprise-wide strategy for their implementation of intelligent automation. Not only are they thinking carefully about each and every customer, through their AI-enabled CRM system, which provides customers with tailored offers, recommendations, and support. But they also utilize bots through RPA, computer vision, and machine learning in their warehouses for order picking and fulfillment. And perhaps the most tangible implementation is their use of intelligent automation in their checkout free experience at their Amazon Go stores. And all of those examples are really impacting how business is done in the areas that Amazon pursues in the market. And so they're, they're utilizing that automation, that intelligent automation across multiple business units in different ways. And we're all seeing their market advantage grow daily in large part because of their investment in and scaling of those capabilities. It is one of the most visible examples in the market of intelligent automation being used as a core competency. Equally as important as having the strategy is having a plan for managing the change. Uh, you know, Amazon grew up a lot around technology. And so the, the amount of change that they had to go through to do that, you could probably have a long conversation with Jeff Bezos about that and, and where they started as a bookseller online and moved to this, how much organizational change they went through. But how you communicate these changes to your, to your employees about the uptick they're going to see in intelligent automation and the changes that will result is a key focus. And then upskilling and reskilling workers has to be a top priority. You're going to be dependent on those employees to make this happen. And because some of their work is changing, doesn't mean that their importance in helping that change occur diminishes. So you mentioned reskilling and upskilling human workers as part of the overall strategy required to, to scale intelligent automation. Can you say more about what you think that entails? And, and does this mean that the head of HR, for example, needs to be a, an integral part of digital transformation? Well, let's we'll go in reverse order. So to answer your question about the head of HR being involved, definitely. Uh, in most organizations, HR plays a key role in hiring and developing employee capabilities, as well as facilitating change adoption. Those are critical to adopting digital labor as well. So when thinking about the importance of upskilling and retooling employees to embrace intelligent automation, I like to refer to something Catherine Wetmer from uh, the international CIO Morgan Stanley said, you know, she said, quote, you need to train employees on how to use the technology. You need to make them think about the business problem they're trying to solve and the capabilities that are out there. They have to think bigger and think deeply about what they can use technology to solve for them. And to Catherine's point, we have to start upskilling our employees to go from thinking transactionally to thinking strategically. We need to train individual contributors to be managers of digital labor. That's not a, a career path and progression that has traditionally been in the workforce. That requires training employees to utilize design thinking, increase their emotional intelligence, 
and shift their focus to solving complex problems. Those aren't minor changes that can be done through a free online class. They require focused investment. Mm. A lot of what you're talking about, Kevin, sounds completely non-technical. It, it's more about how a company goes about implementing change in general and the capabilities of their leadership versus the actual intelligent automation technology. Would you agree? I do. Uh, it, it really comes down to the why and the how regarding leadership choosing to adopt these new capabilities in their organizations. So when we look at the why, why do they feel the need to implement intelligent automation in the first place? And what problems are they solving for? You know, with Amazon, there were specific examples we went through. Why do they take what are potentially very risky moves as early adopters of new capabilities? And what are the driving factors in that behavior? At, at AM, we've seen a common trend when it comes to leaders being motivated to take on potentially risky strategies. One of my partners out of San Francisco, Will Lovis, has said that companies that have created a culture of doing hard things, accepting change, and being resilient are much more likely to implement and scale a new capability like intelligent automation. It's just in their DNA to tackle those types of tasks and reap the benefits. They recognize change as an opportunity rather than a burden, even when it's truly difficult to achieve. Hmm. And in similar fashion, Tom Elsenbrook, who's the CEO of our corporate performance improvement practice at AM, shared that leaders who are motivated by the idea of constant improvement tend to adopt changes and jump on opportunities. Tom will tell you that intellectual curiosity is a crucial component of a leader's ability to look for and move forward with new capabilities like, a, like intelligent automation. And so one of the keys around this is going to be finding companies that are led by people who have those leadership characteristics. Right. So when we get to the how, so how do they plan for change and manage its impact on their employees' roles and responsibilities? How do they prepare for the cultural impact that deploying these intelligent automation capabilities will have on their organizations? And they've spent time building a culture in their company and it's going to be impacted by this. It just will, it needs to be thought out. How do they account for the apprehension that their employees are gonna feel? And how do they account for that in their overarching strategy? What do they do to bring their employees along the change curve? Because the apprehension is real. It's gonna be there until people have a better understanding of, of what's going on and where they play a fit, where they play a role. Uh, for example, Susan Steele is the CHRO at Cision. At a recent blog that emphasized that change management you know, when you're deploying intelligent automation is a real game changer. Uh, she and her team empowered employees at the department level to think creatively about the ways in which automation could improve their day-to-day -day jobs. And then by creating advocates at the line level through a well-deployed center of excellence and addressing their fears and apprehension with education and ownership, they've been able to be very successful at getting their employees engaged and not just engaged, but excited about where they're going with the work that they're doing in their company. Hmm. Interesting. Are there behaviors that, in your opinion, hinder leaders from taking these types of risk? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, there are. Um, and, you know, the one thing that most every consultant will agree on is that generally people don't like change. And this represents change. So, for example, when time and investment dollars are scarce, and thoughtful executives tend to rely on pattern recognition to make quick decisions. Uh, regarding a go or no go on a new management technique or capability. And with something familiar, they can do the mental math in their head. You know, if I spend X, it will likely produce Y and have Z effect on my team and their employees. They're used to doing that. That's part of how they've gotten to where they are in their organizations and leading these organizations. Emerging technology and the capabilities that come along with it are a different story. It's less familiar, the mental math is more complex, 
And the playbook doesn't already exist. It may not be a playbook that they've seen before and that they can apply that simple algorithm to. So it takes time and work to understand the disruption and the impact that new capability will have on their company. And therefore, it's less likely to be a top priority. So another behavior that could deter them uh, from investing and scaling is that leaders are, you know, they're managing the status quo sometimes. They're worried to ruffle feathers or risk disruption of their business because frankly, things are fine. They don't have that burning platform or they're within a couple of years of retirement and they'd really like to just keep things the way they are until they get there. They're following the country club model, as Tom would say, you know, where current members cover costs and there's no need to recruit any new members. Life is good as it is, and you just don't need to make it any harder. So why do that? Okay. Well, Kevin, we've reached the end of our discussion today. I just want to thank you for your time and your input. We are rapidly approaching an era when intelligent automation truly will be a, a core competency of most organizations where companies think digital first and really reimagine and rethink about all the work going on in their companies and how do they shift that uh, in a way that, that really unleashes the potential of their human labor. And I know, I know Alvarez and Marcel will be out there in the market working with companies to help them get there. So thank you for your thoughts and insights. Uh, very interesting stuff today and be well. Thank you, Brad. Thank you for having me on today. Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how Blueprism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now. Thank you.